Good morning. Join me now in our call to worship. We come today like Adam and Eve. We come today like Jesus. As we come today to worship God, let us acknowledge our temptations and seek God's sustaining presence and grace. Our hymn of adoration, we love to tell the story.
Join me now in our invocation and the Lord's Prayer. Lord, so many folks misunderstand, thinking Christianity is a way for perfect people. <laughs> Once one joins, everything is smooth, or at least appears to be. It isn't true. It's an extra burden working to become Christ-like. Jesus did not favor the good folks. He ate with sinners, healed the sick, spoke to the confused, welcomed lepers, and cared for unpopular bureaucrats. We don't belong to Jesus because we are good. We come to him because we sin. And Lord, we know in his redeeming love and your grace, we grow and grow into his likeness. May it be so today, in whose name we pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The psalm today is Psalm 65, verses 1 through 8, read responsively. What mighty praise, O God, belongs to you in Zion. We will fulfill our vows to you. Though we are overwhelmed by our sins, you forgive them all. Your, you faithfully answer our prayers with awesome deeds. Our God, our Savior, you are the hope of everyone on earth, even those who sail on distant seas. You quieted the raging oceans with their pounding waves and silenced the shouting of the nations. Please take a moment and say good morning to the rest of us as we greet each other. And to the people out on our video connection. Good morning, Kevin. Um, I'm looking for any prayer concerns for, from our congregation. Yes. Ray and Joyce Bird. Fran? Deb? Swansea Baptist Church? When is that discussion? All right. And you said? Uh huh. Of course. Well, we want to keep David in our prayers as well, Deb. Is there anyone else? Yes. Um, 
and the bake sale would be as part of the rummage and uh, yard sale. Okay, and that brings that up. Out on the table, there are posters. Please, please, please spread them around because that's how we get people to come. Um, and Kevin worked hard this morning getting those ready for us, okay? okay. Told you. Um, and as I'm sure you're aware, we continue to do our, our regular collection of uh, goods for the food pantry. They're looking, you, there's a list of things listed in the program if you are interested in helping with that. Um, I think that's it today. If you come up with anything, let me know and I'll try to add it in. All right. Let us be in the spirit of giving as we give our offering to the Lord. Giver of all good gifts, we give thanks for your most special gift of all, your son Jesus. We dedicate these, our gifts, that all may come to know of his goodness and love. As we grow in our giving, may we also come to know the gift of service, of a life lived for others. Amen. Please join me now in the hymn of worship for the beauty of the earth.
Our scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 through 19 and 25 through 30. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and we did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say, he is a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of a tax collector and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have relieved them to infants, revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And my burden is light. May the, God, may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. Reflecting on the scripture, what does the text say? The reading begins with Jesus's cryptic and unflattering allusion to the games children play. But elsewhere, Jesus says that unless you become as a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He then complains that critics say that his cousin John is too strict, but that Jesus himself is too freewheeling. Jesus goes on to pronounce a couple of woes on some nearby cities. He then gives thanks that these things have been hidden from so-called wise and intelligent, but revealed to infants. The infants know more than the adults. And then this gospel reading includes the well-known great invitation in verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Hymns are sung based on that one sentence alone, for it is very comforting thought that no matter what the burden, Christ will always be there to help. Now, as we ponder the Christ's wisdom, let us enter into our time of silent meditation.
We waste too much of our lives in anxious fretting. We may even lose the ability and the desire to celebrate. Even in sleep, our worries cling to us. In our bodies, we bear the marks of the strains and stresses that shadow our days and cloud our dreams at night. Our muscles sometimes ache from the unrelenting tension with which we live and work. Often, we are not even aware that we have clenched our teeth or tightened the muscles of our neck and back into knots. Tension makes our heads ache. It puts a sharpness in our speech and depletes our reserves of energy, patience, and peace. There is no peace. Deliver us from the anxiety that sometimes consumes us, robs us of contentment and calm, we confess to you the faithless fears and worldly anxieties that make us old before our time and to undermine the integrity of our witness to Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Lord, help us put our lives in order. order. Banish from our presence those things that undermine our confidence in you. Show us how to use the time we have more effectively. Help us avoid wasting time on silly efforts to impress others, on gossip and fear-mongering among our colleagues, on jockeying for advantageous position, on attempting to undermine the competition. Such activities are unworthy of people created in your image and distract us from the work you have called us to perform. Let us freed from anxiety-producing habits Work up to our abilities, whatever our tasks may be. Keep our hearts and minds centered on you that we may trust you to take care of our concerns while we take care to be your disciples in our present circumstances. And for those of us who are extra burdened, we pray that through Jesus Christ, our friends, family, neighbors, and loved ones may receive your blessings. Lord, we pray for Joyce and Ray Bird, for my sister-in-law, Laura Waddell, and her brother, David Cook, for Fran, who continues to battle her cancer, for the Swansea Baptist Church, and the hope that they'll be guided in the best way possible forward, for Colette to celebrate her feeling better and able to move a little bit more and able to kind of think of us as well for Debbie Parker, who struggles with her life situation and what's been going on, and for David, not knowing where he is or what is happening to him and wanting only the best for him. For my son, John, who's looking for a new job and hoping to come this way, and for Scott and Priscilla, who continue to work on improving Scott's quality of life. Lord Father, grant us the ability to remain calm in the midst of crisis especially when those around us are out of their minds with worry and fear. Give us, give us the self-control and wisdom to allow our ordered lives to witness your peaceful presence at the center of our being. Help us your, share your peace with our coworkers, our neighbors, and our families, that many may have reason to turn to you in trust and praise. For as Jesus said, Come to me, all, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. We pray this in Jesus' sake. Amen. Our hymn of petition is Take My Life and Let It Be.
Thank you. Our scripture text this morning is Romans 7, 15 to 25. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that the good does not dwell within me, that is, in my flesh. For the desire to do the good lies close at hand, but not the ability. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my, most, in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched person that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind I am enslaved to the law of God, but with my flesh I am enslaved to the law of sin. Rocking gray to spiritual health. Oh, sorry, gray rocking to spiritual health, sorry. The person you most want to avoid and need to avoid is yourself. Some people you just don't want to run into, but it happens, inadvertently, of course. Maybe it's the pompous neighbor down the street an old friend from college or your nemesis in the lunchroom. You dodge, duck, turn around and walk away faster than a scalded cat. You'll get something from the vending machine instead. You might see him across the street while you're rolling your trash can to the curb or waiting in the line at the coffee shop and then regrettably he sees you and you avert your eyes and make a beeline in the opposite direction. Why? Because you know him. He is narcissistic and a master manipulator. He uses passive aggressive behavior to get what he wants. He's abusive and threatening. He withholds information or spreads rumors. He is dishonest. He thinks he's charming and flirtatious and not above suggesting that if you're nice to him, he'll be nice to you. You've met people like this. You may be struggling with a coworker, family member, or so-called friend who's not above blaming you or even blackmailing you. If something sours in the relationship, you are to blame. The truth is repackaged and you are made to think that you are the one who's going crazy. What's shocking is that you encounter this person every day and it begins in the morning when you first arise and look in the mirror. That person is you. This is what the author of our sacred text for today is saying. The Apostle Paul suggests a strategy that some psychologists call gray rocking, pretending that we're a gray rock in our interactions with this manipulative, narcissistic, attention-grabbing bore. Everything they do affects us no more than it might affect a rock or boulder on the, in the room. It bounces off of us. Like a cold stone, we have no reaction. Like a rock, we show no emotion. Like an immovable and immutable boulder, we just sit there, totally ignoring the bore until they walk away. This is not the only scheme white might use to deal with people who exaggerate their own importance. But many practitioners of gray rocking say it works rather well. A quick start to gray rocking. Holly Richmond, a licensed marriage and family therapist, 
says, the first step is to visually visualize yourself as a gray rock. You're this immovable, impenetrable force who's disinterested. If they ask you a question, say yes or no, and don't give details about your life or admit you're practicing this gray rock method. Also known as gray walling, gray walking is a strategy that involves being as disengaged and unresponsive as a corpse in a cemetery. Be as tight-lipped, terse, and tacturn as possible. You want to be as invisible as sleeves on a vest. This person could talk the ears off a mule, but you limit your responses so that your unwanted conversational partner gets the message, go away. Other techniques include avoiding eye contact, pretending that you're bored out of your mind, and making sure that the tone of your voice varies no more than one step on the musical scale. A flat tone will best convey to this person with a 10-gallon mouth that you're not interested. It's important to protect ourselves from obnoxious people, but what is surprising is that the toxic person in Romans 7 may in fact be ourselves, or what the apostle calls the old nature, or what the King James version of the Bible calls the old man. The text depicts a conversation within ourselves between the law of the mind and the law of sin. What this bifurcated person wants to do is obey the law of God. But there's a problem. A war between these fraction, factions is raging inside the soul. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it, writes the apostle. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. Wretched man that I am. It's the war between the good wolf and the bad one, between Narcissus and Goldman, the responsible older brother and the reckless younger brother, between Cain and Abel, between the flesh and the spirit, between Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, between purity and porn. It's the conflict between light and darkness, the temptation that pulsates between sin and sanctity, the battle between good and evil. So you're tired of fighting this battle? Tired of making New Year's resolutions about losing weight, quitting a habit, spending more time on your peloton, knowing that noble aspirations are like pushing a wheelbarrow with rope handles zero chance of success. Tired? Then try these gray rocking strategies recommended by therapists Holly Richmond and St. Paul for dealing with obnoxious people, especially when the person is yourself. One caveat. When dealing with real people in real life, we must remember that we are servants of Jesus Christ and that most moments have the possibility of being redeeming moments, opportunities to share the love of Christ, but not when dealing with what Paul calls our old self. Read on. Don't defend. No need to apologize for what some might regard as rude behavior. Sometimes you've got to do it when you've got to do it. The Bible says that we cannot play nice with the ugly side of our human nature. It must be mastered or it will master us. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we may no longer be enslaved to sin. 
Notice the severe and bloody imagery associated with the Bible's call to be done with their dominating and cruel master. Put to death, crucify, deny ourselves, and so on. So we do not need to defend our hardline policy when it comes to deciding what behaviors are in our best interest. And if that means gray rocking a bad habit or a bad place, then so be it. Don't engage. When cornered by a bore we wish we could avoid, it's absolutely the wrong tactic to engage this person in any way. If we do, we prolong the time he or she will spend with us. The result is that we are trapped in a conversation or experience from which it might be agonizing minutes or hours before we can be set free. So we do not engage. We cannot have dalliance whatsoever with the habit or the temptation we think we can handle. We can never win the battle in a conflict with someone who can suck the life out of us. They will win every time. We cannot think they are impervious to temptation and sidle up to it as if it was a long lost friend. We won't walk away unscathed. We must turn around, cross the street, duck into a corner, but under no circumstances do we engage. We're like a gray pebble in the roadway. That's how much we care about our former way of life. Don't explain. One of the things you don't do when dealing with an unwelcome person is to explain your strategy. You don't explain to the hapless fellow that you're totally ignoring them and that this is an avoidance tactic known as gray rocking or gray walling. You don't share this information because they don't need to know and probably wouldn't even care if they did. Nor do we explain or rationalize to ourselves the reason we're being so ruthless against the enemy within. In the television series, NCIS, Special Agent Gibbs' rule number 16 is, if someone thinks they have the upper hand, break it. You don't explain, you just do it. You leave, you walk away, you ignore, but you don't explain. You, don't, you do not need to beat yourself up before you decide to flee temptation, resist the devil, and gain the upper hand in your spiritual life. According to Wikipedia, the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson is one of the most famous pieces of English literature and is considered to be a defining book of the Gothic horror genre. The novella has had a sizable impact on popular culture, with the phrase Jekyll and Hyde being used in vernacular to refer to people with an outwardly good but sometimes shockingly evil nature. In the story, Jekyll drinks a serum that allows him to indulge his vices without fear of detection. Jekyll transforms into a wholly different person, someone who looks younger, but somehow decrepit, smaller, and malevolent. Whereas Jekyll is a good man, kind-hearted, conscientious, Hyde is evil, self-indulgent, and uncaring. Initially, Jekyll controls the metamorphosis with a potion, but increasingly, it becomes difficult for the wicked Hyde to return to the beneficent Jekyll. For re one reason for this is that Hyde enjoys being Hyde. Or if we're honest, we must admit that there's more than a grain of truth to this notion. Although we might lament and wail, it does the Apostle Paul Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? A part of us doesn't want to let go of the vices we serve. We've developed a sort of perverse Stockholm syndrome in which we have a vague sympathy for an attachment to our taskmaster, our captor, our jailer. St. Augustine echoed a similar sentiment when contemplating a future of living a chaste and holy life, and he said, in effect, I am willing, O Lord, but not right now. Dr. Jekyll expressed the Pauline dilemma in words that sound eerily familiar. I saw that of the two natures that contended in the field of my consciousness, I was radically both. 
I was the curse of mankind in those incongruous logs where, where thus bound together, that in the uh, agonizing womb of consciousness, these polar twins should be continuously struggling. How then were they disassociated? For his part, Dr. Jekyll resolves to cease becoming Hyde, as we too often resolve to stop obeying our sinful natures. Yet, despite all of his best intention, one night he, in a moment of weakness, and once again drinks the tincture, whereupon Hyde, his desires having been caged for so long, kills a man. Jekyll is horrified and tries to earnestly to stop the transformations. Eventually, one of the chemical used in the serum runs low, and subsequent batches prepared from new stocks fail to work. Jekyll speculates that one of the original ingredients must have had some unknown impurity that made it work. Realizing that he would stay transformed as Hyde, Jekyll wrote out a full account of events and locked himself in his laboratory with the intent of keeping Hyde imprisoned. And as friends and household staff are about to apprehend him, he commits suicide by swallowing a poison. This scenario seems to be one with which the ancient apostle wrestled, as do we. Do any of these thoughts resonate with our own experiences? I don't understand my own actions. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. When I want to, what I want to do is good, evil lies close at hand. I am captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me? Do you recognize these words? They are cited verbatim from today's readings in Romans 7. They're from the pen of the Apostle Paul. If St. Paul, revered theologian, evangelist, apostle, and martyr of the Christian faith had such sentiments, sentiments. Perhaps it shouldn't surprise us if we do too. It might even come as a relief. But Paul had a gray rock so powerful, it turned sin away before it got in the door. Unlike the poor Dr. Jekyll, Paul had a potion so powerful it not only transformed him permanently into his better self, but destroyed Mr. Hyde forever. Paul had help being the person he truly wanted to be. From, and that help comes from Jesus Christ himself. Read what he writes. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's all about Jesus. And we are Jesus' people. Amen. Our hymn of benediction today is When We Walk with the Lord.
One man's obedience made many righteous. Receive God's abundant grace and walk in the way of obedience. Amen.